Good morning, dear participants. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the third and last day of uh, Marov. We will talk about urban resilience and sustainable cultural heritage management today. I'd like to introduce the panelists first. Um, we are a bit late. It's um, a very busy panel, so we will have, well, as I said, the title of the panel is Urban Resilience and Sustainable Cultural Heritage Management. Lessons from Istanbul is the um, subtitle. Because we are in Istanbul, we, we chose this title, but we will uh, hear about the UK case and the Turkey case, and we will discuss those cases together. Uh, we, will, we have uh, very distinguished panelists here today. I'd like to briefly introduce them. Before that, I'd like to say that in this panel, we have two universities present. I mean, it, it is a collaborative effort. From Istanbul Shehir in Istanbul Shehir University, for the last three to four years, we have had very comprehensive projects on Istanbul heritage. Um, we have uh, faculty members from Shehir University at the same time. We have faculty members from Anglia Ruskin University, architecture department, School of Architecture there. Um, uh, and the faculty members, they work in the fields of conservation as well, sur building surveying and conservation of buildings. So, well, um, Ellen Cody is a principal lecturer at Anglia Ruskin University. He is um, built environment director of research and faculty director of the professional doctorate program. And we have um, Halib Rahim who, um, um, his whose interests are in the same field at Shehir University. Eda Önüce Soy, she comes from the social department and she's, she's a member of the um, Urban Research uh, Center. From Anglia Ruskin University, we have Lakshmi Rajendran. She's also, um, she works in the area of cultural heritage management. Uh, Nezapi Delo Deleye is also a faculty member at Anglia Rask University, uh, city planning and cons uh, urban conservation. Yunus Ur is from Shehir University, uh, urban research center director. I'd like to leave the floor uh, to Ellen Kode. Ellen will talk about heritage management in the UK, cultural heritage in the UK. We can start with him. Uh, you are first. <laughs> Mahaba. <laughs> Hello, good morning. And what a treat to be here on the last day. And I want to start by saying thank you to the translators because they have made this communication so easy for everybody. <laughs> and they made me realize that my own title needed translation. So let's start with that. That in Eastern England, uh, we have building preservation trusts, which is a concept that needs translation. Because a trust is a group of people who have signed a legal agreement to, to look after a building. But they do not have to be involved in preservation. And most of these trusts are involved in conservation. And the trusts are aiming to support the community in coming together with a common belief that their heritage will drive them forwards. So that's what we need to start with a translation. I and my colleagues 
talk about BPTs, BPTs, but that's why we don't talk about BPTs. The word is confusing. It's actually heritage conservation trusts. But if you talk about HCTs, nobody knows what you mean. So we have this, this term, BPT, Building Preservation Trusts. So that's what my talk is about, the way that people can come together with a shared belief that their heritage will carry them forwards. So let's see how this is done. I have three simple tasks. Firstly, to explain the context. Secondly, to talk about the challenge. And the challenge is that our heritage in the UK, if not globally, is at risk. And thirdly, to offer a solution. And I believe that one solution is through building preservation trusts or we would like to call them heritage conservation trusts. And we can look at the skills within those trusts and the success that they bring to communities to make them resilient. So my day job is with the university and I talk to hundreds of undergraduates. I talk to about 100 master's students and I am directing a program with 20, 24 of my own and eight, uh, six other PhD candidates. And my ambition in life is to introduce as many people as possible to heritage buildings and the value of that, that culture that we need to research and understand to take us forward as a community, as a resilient community. So here I am on the top of a contemporary building in the UK, in central London. Uh, it's a 1952 grade one listed building, our highest rank of protection for designated heritage assets. Uh, but then we also look at projects which are more to do with restoration. And this is one of very few projects which is actually about restoration. And here I am bringing 100 undergraduates into a, a, a, a, a 19th century agricultural building where we need to find a way forward to bring people together uh, to, to form a resilient community. So let's look at heritage buildings in the UK. There are approximately half a million listed buildings, buildings with legal protection. There are around 70,000 in Scotland, so, sorry, I should emphasize half a million in England, 70,000 in Scotland, 30,000 in Wales, and 9,000 in Northern Ireland. So we have just over half a million buildings in the UK. And the UK, can, to give you a scale for, for Turkey, is about 240,000 square kilometers. And this is the town near where I live, where the Saxons invaded by river and they landed and they set up a market up our high street and we have medieval buildings, we have Saxon buildings, we have Georgian buildings and we have Victorian buildings. So a, a typical high street uh, perhaps in, a, in an English town. But this small English town uh, of, of 360 square kilometers has 10,000 listed buildings. And in that spectrum of buildings, some of them are at risk. So let's start to look at the, the risk. And our challenge, for me personally, and for us all in the audience, is to how, work out how to rescue these buildings at risk. But rescue them in a way that will bring the communities together. English Heritage say there are only 961 buildings at risk. I don't believe that because in my own environment I know that in my county alone there are 239 buildings at risk in my county. There are 48 counties in England so I estimate there are 11,000 listed buildings and here is one of them. 
uh, a 16th century building which is struggling to survive. I believe that the solution may well be in the, the Building Preservation Trust. So let's look at some trusts. The trusts, and there are um, around about 250, and I was a director of the Association of Building Preservation Trusts, which has rebranded because of the complication of that word preservation in the title. And it's been rebranded the Heritage Trust Network and it's a UK-wide organisation. They're across the UK, but the people that fund it, and this is my region, were only aware of 17 trusts. So one of my students and master students went to find out the truth, what is actually happening in different communities. And he found that there are more than 17 in the county, there are over 94 just in our region some of whom are in the Association of Preservation Trusts, 29%, and some that are not. So let's have a look at, at what their skills, and this was the data that we gathered. So we've got the data and we can talk about that at, at another time. Um, I want to talk about some of the skills that they developed, but more importantly, I want to look at their projects. We can talk about the skills. They vary in size from projects from 100,000 pounds to 4 million pounds a big spread because it needs to match the community's needs. So let's look at some examples. Here we are at a water mill, and I had the pleasure of taking my colleagues around this marvelous mill. But look, it only took 48,000 pounds just over 10 years ago to catalyze this building that was at risk into a whole community. So, yes, it is an educational centre, and it is a tea room where people can come together. And they do sell flats, flour, they mill flour and sell flour. But what else do they do for the community? Answer, you won't believe it. They set up workshops for making baskets from willow, from printmaking, from rag making, from bread making, from felt making, from stitch working, from creative photography to painting and sketching to the skills of the miller. This is a hub where people come together to share skills, to teach, and to welcome. Uh, this, this is an, a, a school, but it's not a school. It was a guild house from the 15th century. And this preservation trust took 1.6 million pounds to turn it into a community hub. So allowing buildings to move forwards through a well-informed conservation plan to embrace the local community. So the children come off the bus and instead of going home and playing on their machines, they go into this 15th century building and they talk to their friends. Their parents know where they are. It's a community success. And here is another one at the other end of the scale, the Great Yarmouth Preservation Trust. A another trust which is entirely not for profit, where those trustees come together for the benefit of the community. This scheme brought together 29 partners funded through an EU scheme to turn this warehouse into, which, which was a a political building, it was a, a com an industrial building, and then a, com a, a political building, and now it is a community building. It's a building where the homeless can go and be safe, where the homeless can go and work. It is run by a homeless person. It is the absolute foundation of a community building by the community for the community. So, we've had about the context, uh, and I, I've introduced you to the solution, one of which I believe is building preservation trusts, who are trustees not for profit, but for the benefit of the community. They have informed policy for adaptive reuse on sound conservation principles. And because this is a forum, I want to leave with some questions. And my first question is, 
How well established is your at-risk register? I was proud of the at-risk register in the UK until I found out that through austerity and cuts, the people that make the lists have gone. And what's published on the internet is not necessarily true. And you need to go back to the community to find out what is going on. The second question is, do you have a mechanism like the Building Preservation Trust movement? And thirdly, do you think there's the possibility of coming together to form not just an association of Building Preservation Trusts, or a heritage trust network, but a heritage network across Europe or across nations. So that's my third question. Do you think that is a, a way forward? And I, it's a fantastic week to meet lots of people with the same passion as me and the same belief that our culture, our heritage, can take us forward into a more resilient society. So if, if those things interest you, I would love to talk to you. Thank you. Esheku. Çok teşekkürler, Alan. Thank you very much, Alan. Alan talked about some challenges financial challenges, political challenges, or challenges in the decision-making process. Despite all these challenges, UK has gathered vast experience about heritage management. Alan took us to a trip across the UK, and we saw a lot of examples, and you can see that all of them are success stories. The questions raised by Alan are very meaningful, so I'm waiting for the interaction from the audience. Alan mentioned one more thing. In addition to Heritage National Foundation, Trust Foundation, there is also a lottery fund. I think this is a model which can be considered in Turkey as well. Because we have a large market for lotteries in Turkey. I think we can extract positive lessons or negative lessons. We can think of pros and cons of such systems. And if the pros are on the weighing side, then maybe we can uh, implant it in Turkey. We can learn from the UK experience, of course. Thank you very much, Alan, for your contribution. Our next speaker is Nezapi Dele. The stage is yours. Okay, can you hear me again then? Right, good. Um, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm gonna talk about heritage-based resilience, uh, but I'm not gonna say very much about heritage, um, and I'm not gonna say very much about resilience. Um, I'll talk about the drivers and um, framework that is um, behind the Herald Project that we're doing with colleagues um, at Seher University, um, some theoretical views, and I'll mention two research projects that are relevant to uh, what we're trying to do with Harold, uh, and I'll end with some discussion points. 
So there are some quotes here from Christopher Alexander, um, a famous architect um, who started something called the pattern language back in the 1970s. Uh, this was in um, response to a, a lot of um, urban planning uh, that was happening. Some of it is still happening. So there's a lot of knowledge um, that has been built up over the past 40 years about what works and what doesn't. Uh, more recently, uh, the new urbanism movement um, that started in the United States has taken on some of his ideas and some ideas from Jane Jacobs and other uh, theoreticians uh, and tried to sort of apply that um, in the form of a transect, uh, taking a section through um, a region and looking at what is most appropriate at each uh, part of the region in terms of density. But they're also looking at the layers that make up cities um, and how to prescribe form. More recently, again, um, there's work that's been done that um, arose from what used to be local Agenda 21, um, looking at sustainable communities um, and a range of factors that con contribute towards uh, sustainable communities uh, and looking at what the spatial expression of that would, would look like in terms of a neighborhood. The range of facilities, uh, mobility, uh, open spaces. And um, in the last couple of years, with the new urban agenda, a lot of this earlier knowledge and critique um, is being brought together for cities. Uh, I, part I particularly like uh, the version of the um, Sustainable Development Goals uh, that has been produced by the Stockholm Resilience Institute because it highlights um, the extent to which um, all these um, goals actually depend on the biosphere. Uh, the economy relies on society, and society relies on the environment. In relation to the project that we're working on, um, some of these ideas from the city we need, um, being socially inclusive, uh, being regenerative, having a sense of identity and a sense of place, uh, and contributing towards good health, these are all relevant to what we're trying to do. So in terms of the Herald project itself um, that Anglia Ruskin uh, is working on with uh, colleagues at uh, Sheher University, um, these are our aims. We're looking at a number of issues. Heritage is um, the main concern uh, in relation to the Istanbul uh, Growth Master Plan. Uh, the idea that what happens should be smart, should be sustainable. How do we uh, reconcile this with the need for conservation? So there are a lot of drivers in terms of, of urban development, in terms of needs. Um, we're particularly looking at these three uh, goals, health and well-being, decent work, and sustainable cities and communities in relation to heritage. So in terms of heritage, um, we're not just looking at buildings. It's about cities. It's about how they work. It's about their livability. Um, and one of the uh, issues that um, Ian Bentley um, a well-known urban designer has raised is the role of economics and the way in which very often the, e the economic uh, development cycle is in tension with what we're looking for. Um, all the, the characters, um, all the characteristics that make up a sense of place are very often lost because of this uh, cycle which is accelerating. The need to make a profit and extract value from land. So the urban challenges that we're faced with, um, primarily in Europe, are around an aging population, um, infrastructure that is also aging and needs replacing, um, a whole set of needs um, that in urban areas are very, very complex and interrelated. Uh, smart cities have been proposed as um, a solution in terms of maximizing and optimizing technology. Um, but is that really the answer? What about people? So uh, on to two projects um, that I'm involved in. This one is looking at urban stakeholders, particularly planners. Um, and one of the reasons for looking at them is to say, well, if these are some of the, the stakeholders that we are relying on uh, to achieve um, urban goals, uh, what issues do they have? Uh, their expert knowledge is supposed to help us solve social problems. Uh, planners, in particular, are supposed to be working in the public interest. A key issue is how much ability do they have to act? 
So far, we've done about 40 interviews with uh, what we call mid-career planners, uh, the younger planners, and legacy planners. Uh, one of the legacy planners is in the audience uh, today. She's um, a Turkish planner um, who played uh, a really leading role um, uh, in London uh, in pushing forward the sustainability um, agenda. Um, and she was interviewed um, amongst uh, the other uh, participants. So focusing on the sustainability and agency questions uh, that we asked them. A lot of the mid-career uh, planners feel constrained. Um, although they are positive um, about their, their, their desire to act, but they're having to work with the system. In terms of their ability to achieve sustainability and resilience, there are these tensions, these conflicts that they're having to navigate. Uh, a property conflict uh, between equity and uh, economics, a resource conflict between the environment and economics, and a development conflict um, between uh, equity and environmental protection. And these are partic particularly um, acute when it comes to preservation uh, and environmental issues. In terms of agency, uh, the older, more experienced legacy planners um, had developed an ability to recognize spaces where they could act and to take those opportunities. Um, they thought that the shift in planning that occurred um, in the early noughties was helpful in making them more proactive. Um, but one of them mentioned that he lost his job because of his passion to, to, to try and get things done, which was considered to be beyond the remit of planning at that time. In terms of sustainability, uh, the, the more experienced legacy planners really made a difference. They pushed the boundaries. Um, and helped change policy by developing tools and guidance. So a number of threads emerging from looking at planners who are meant to be able to help us achieve these goals. Um, innovation is possible. It depends on scale. Um, awareness of how much power they do have and how to use it is, is, is critical, as well as um, allies and contacts. The second um, uh, research uh, project is a very local one in Chelmsford. And it's about how do we go beyond the planning system with local communities? How do we ensure that communities are involved, not just when a planning application comes in, that there's an ongoing conversation and discussion about the place, about what happens there, about what people want and what they need? So um, the initiative that we began with uh, the city council and with local stakeholders was very much a, a, around starting and maintaining that dialogue. Um, there were three heritage buildings that we focused on um, and did um, a number of uh, initiatives, public engagement, um, uh, talking with uh, developers and with the planners. Um, and all three um, are now in um, active use. Uh, one has been refurbished. Community engagement took different forms. Um, one of the things that we did was to start a festival, um, an ideas festival uh, in Chelmsford, which involved uh, local people, uh, children, our students, um, and uh, local practitioners with a range of ideas um, and um, activities each year. And that led to the establishment of a community space, the Ideas Hub. Uh, which has been instrumental in uh, looking after um, members of the uh, community who were previously ignored uh, and who previously had nowhere to go because the city was considered to be affluent. So um, many of these um, um, ideas are captured in a chapter in a book that was launched recently called Our City. Uh, I think I'll end there. Um, I have further... Uh, discussion points um, around heritage versus smart cities. What's the balance between continuity and change that we need? Issues around cultural resilience uh, center on uh, diversity and uh, establishing a sense of belonging, um, particularly in uh, new members of a community. And the issues that, that I've raised um, in these two research projects around stakeholders, planners, um, other professionals, 
and the public all need to be empowered, all need to be aware of the range of tools that they have and the mechanisms for actually deploying those together. Thank you. Could you close the microphone? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nezapi. Well, uh, planning practices and city design, urban design, participatory preservation, uh, and various keywords uh, were mentioned, uh, were elaborated in this presentation. Uh, preservation during the 21st century, what's the scale and the s um, dimensions of preservations for this current century? I mean, in our uh, applications, you may ask your questions. Uh, by the way, uh, we have an application to a for asking questions. Uh, heritage, smart cities, dilemma, uh, how can we, how can, can two, those two interact? And then cultural resilience, it, it is perceived in different ways uh, by communities, it is, requires capacity building and different approaches, and stakeholders, and the governance issues. Well, uh, new urbanism, a vision the, in, entails all of those, um, and we have to also consider, of course, various preservation practices. Uh, well, thank you. The next speaker is Lakshmi Rajendran. Lakshmi. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving this opportunity. Thanks to Marmara Urban Forum and Shahar University for giving this opportunity to present this. Uh, okay. Uh, it's always difficult to uh, talk uh, after Alan and Nizapi because they are quite. Alan is very eloquent, which you would have realized, and Nizapi is no kind of throwing so many ideas, which is very stimulating and all that. And then, okay, here I am. Um, so I'm going to talk about slow and smart uh, heritage-led resilience approach to smart cities. Um, in a way, I should, you know, if I just reflect back on uh, how I have traveled from UK to here, like I boarded uh, morning 10, like 12, 10 a flight, and then I checked in 8 o'clock, and 9 o'clock I'm here. Uh, so I'm sort of unfit to talk this topic uh, in terms of how I lead my life, but <laughs> in terms of cities itself. Uh, my interest in slow and smart cities, uh, to be very frank, developed in the past three or four months. Um, this all started with me writing a short article in Conversation, which is quite uh, an informal forum where our researchers bring in ideas, throw ideas, and discuss concepts which are emerging within cities' uh, research domain. And then, um, so I was, I was discussing issues of you know, uh, why we should be slow uh, uh, in generally leading life in cities and uh, how uh, technologies does not support this concept of temporalities uh, or does not consider the importance of temporalities in cities. Um, uh, yeah, so it just started with such a sh short article throwing ideas, why not slow and smart? Uh, and then I got these uh, emails and phone calls from Reuters and you know, Dubai Foundation asking, so how are we going to make cities slow and smart? And you know, uh, I, I was just taken aback. You know, uh, calm down. I, I, I've not come up with solutions. It's just that you know we are trying to explore how we could do this. So uh, so my interest you know, started with uh, with all this kind of interest coming from different domains, especially from public, from journalists, and all that. Uh, sorry. So we all know um, smart cities is is a sort of buzzword in almost all disciplines. Uh, and uh, just, to, just to show you, you know, what is the impact uh, smart cities can have in terms of energy efficiency is, uh, so it, it would improve 30 percentage in 20 years. And if we make cities smart, uh, the market which is involved in making cities smart is almost like 2.57 trillion by 2025. So it's lots of money, lots of resources, and lots of uh, interest and lots of research going into how we could make cities smart. Uh, uh, 
But one sort of criticism with smart cities have always been faced is uh, how is it uh, taking care of quality of life of people in cities? Uh, so we, we talk about um, giving instant information, in instant communication. Uh, so how is it all related to leading a quality life? Uh, there, are, there are initiatives which are you know, touched upon that. For example, uh, I just picked, uh, I thought this was quite interesting. Um, one project is Virtual Warsaw, uh, a, a smart uh, app which was um, developed for uh, blind people. Uh, so how they could actually navigate the city. So what it does is it, it, it, it, it gives signals. The city is developed with, with a lot of networks, uh, and it gives signals wherever they go, you know, what kind of information they need, um, how, how they can navigate cities without uh, being excluded. So it, it's, a, it's a very inclusive approach to uh, disabled people, uh, mainly the blind people. Uh, so smart cities does touch upon you know, inclusive approaches. Uh, so it, it kind of definitely improves the quality of life of certain groups, so which, which, which in itself is you know, quite uh, encouraging and very progressive in terms of understanding how quality of life is linked to smart cities itself. Uh, but my interest is how, uh, how much is the experiential dimension given importance in all this. Um, so it, it has always been challenging to have a very citizen-centered approach to smart cities. Um, so smart and smart cities means all these terms for different people. Uh, so mostly it's efficiency, productive, uh, being very speedy, and you know, uh, you're optimizing all the resources and you know how the com being competitive as a city. Uh, so smart and smart cities you know, kind of are synonymous to all these. Uh, to different disciplines. Uh, so as I told, my interest is about how the temporal dimension is, um, is taken care and why temporality is, that's where uh, it, the temporal dimension is very important on how we experience city itself. So uh, there is this concept of slow cities, which by itself is not a very new planning or design concept. It all started with this slow food movement, which originated in Italy. Uh, which was kind of uh, a, a movement which was against fast food, um, mainly McDonald's, which came up there. Uh, so it all started as a social movement, uh, and it, it kind of you know, uh, went into slow reading, slow tourism, slow food, and all that. Uh, so it, it, it, it's quite important uh, uh, to make cities slow, and I, I'll tell you how all the slowness would be linked to heritage and couple of slides later. Uh, so the slow city concept itself is grounded in sustainability. In a sense, it kind of gives importance to the character of communities and the local economy, uh, how it can actually be um, helpful for developing local market economy itself. Uh, so it does take care of you know, uh, the identity of that particular local community. Uh, so it, it, it touches upon identity of places, giving uniqueness to that local, uh, unique, uniqueness to that local community, uh, and hence it does make uh, a sustainable community itself. Um, so in terms of urban temporalities, as I told, you know, cities provide us the matrix for us to move, encounter, communicate. We explore spaces in different, uh, in different paces. And uh, the different pace itself is dependent on, you know, dependent on how the kind of job, the kind of background you are in. You know, there's quite a lot of factors which also kind of impact the speed of speed in which people move around in cities. Nevertheless, pace does play a very important role in how we move around. And um, there are quite a lot of uh, initiatives taken by urban activists and artists showing how important slow walks are itself you know, in, uh, in cities. And there are lo lots of small events which happen to, to take around people slowly around the neighborhood, experience the local character of the, uh, of the place, street, communities, uh, so that you, you experience the city in a more, you know, uh, more relaxed way. Uh, so one thing, what uh, within the context of heritage city itself, uh, so heritage city we could we could say is, is almost an unexploited asset uh, because uh, we have lots of aspects which links to the temporal dimension. No, nostalgic and it gives a sense of past and identity is almost the the crux of heritage city itself. 
and there is unique culture and it can boost local economy. So there are lots of aspects within Heritage City which could be taken to consideration for understanding how we could make cities slow. Sorry. Uh, so uh, how is technology and heritage itself has been interacting so far? Um, so as I said earlier, technology is within smart cities is all about giving instant information, services, and entertainment. For example, you, know, you would have seen in airport lots of these video game lounges which are coming up and you know, navigation pods in airport and stations. Um, but what is, what is important to understand when we see this technology within the heritage context is how heritage itself could be given, has the potential of offering new timescapes. Um, so some of, the, some, some of the case studies which I was looking around was um, so media technologies can be used for installations and projections, uh, public exhibitions, which kind of gives an identity narratives for the entire the city itself. And uh, it definitely changes the perception and experience within smart cities when such her when heritage is you know, kind of linked to technology. And uh, one of um, you know, one of the one of the research paper which I uh, which I found on slow tourism uh, by Callet uh, showed this uh, you know, uh, this illustration which says um, how social assets, time, and culture is such an important domain of tourism itself. And uh, so, slow tourism is something which heritage cities can look into, and as well as smart cities. Um, so, if I can just can you please play that link, please. Is it possible to play the link, the video link? So the link shows some of the um, technology-based initiatives um, within the Heritage City concept, and one is um, one is an app developed in England, which uh, allows tourists to you know, download the app, and you can you can navigate some heritage cities. And you know there are these augmented reality aspect which comes in where you can interact with the past. Uh, so it it definitely slows down the way you understand heritage, but still technology is incorporated in that. No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, okay. So uh, you, you, can, you, can, you can log into this website. It's a promotional video showing how technology can be used to make heritage cities smart, at the same time making heritage cities uh, being experienced in a, in a much more uh, experiential way, you know, to, to put it that way. Um, so uh, there are initiatives like that which has come up. Yeah. Uh, so in in in uh, in in my opinion, heritage-led resilience itself uh, is is something which is very very uh, important, and it has quite a lot of potential to make uh, and uh, contribute to urban re resilience itself. So it, uh, it takes care of our temporalities and you know, everyday life, uh, thereby improving the livability in cities. And I did find this article, uh, is, which I had a snapshot. Uh, so this is a blog which is written by, uh, in, a, in Rick's web page. Um, it's Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. So they are talking about, is there a place for heritage in smart cities? And this blog is just written on 29th September, like just a few days back. So. Um, People from different domains are talking about it, and we do understand. You know, uh, heritage cities have quite a lot of potential. So it is, it is, it is, it is for us as designers and planners to understand and how we incorporate it within within the planning and design intervention stage, uh, uh, which could lead to the overall urban resilience itself. Thank you. Teşekkürler Lakshmi. Thank you very much Lakshmi.
I think with this session, we are com coming to a conclusion of the three days. Yesterday and the day before, we talked about digital technologies, scale problems, tourism, local development, challenges, and opportunities that come along. We heard many interventions on these topics. Lakshmi's presentation gave us a perspective about how small cities or small districts can be uh, preserved, can be protected, just like big cities. And we also heard about how we can come up with action plans to slow down, slow ourselves down in larger cities as well. In that sense, that was a very meaningful uh, inter intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions to Lakshmi, please use the app and send your questions through the app. Now we have three presentations in row from Shahir University. The presentations will be about a comprehensive report written on conservation sites, UNESCO conservation sites in Turkey. The research was financially supported by the municipality of Istanbul. The summary report was printed and published by the municipality as well. The content is very wide, actually. The scope of the report is very wide. We have chosen some topics which may be of uh, great interest for you. Because of lack of time, we cannot focus on all the topics covered in the uh, report. The first intervention from Shahir University will be from Mr. Yunus Ur. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. After these three beautiful presentations, we are now focusing on Istanbul, which is in the title of our session. In 2015 and 16, we conducted a study. In my presentation, I'll try to present how we came up with conclusions in that research. And I'll try to provide you with a, a temporal view about how we started and how we developed our ideas as well. So be at the beginning, we wanted to focus on tangible heritage, meaning physical buildings. Secondly, the study was expected to be a conservation-based or conservation-oriented study. I'm sure you all are aware of these concepts, but we have a tangible and intangible cultural heritage. These are two important concepts for us. And cultural heritage is divided into t these two concepts. But in our project, we focused on the tangible uh, cultural heritage artifacts. However, when we came to the end of the project, we uh, had a better understanding of how c tangible and intangible cultural heritage is very are very related and close to each other. We conducted several workshops, and when we started to talk about cultural heritage, everyone was referring to tangible cultural heritage, and. All the participants are aware of the importance of cultural heritage, especially tangible cultural, cultural heritage. And although uh, the main focus was on tangible cultural heritage, we were also uh, discussing on the importance of intangible uh, cultural heritage as well. But when it comes to conservation, we were quite uh, unclear about what needs to be conserved and how tangible and intangible cultural heritage artifacts could be 
conserved. We were discussing about how we can approach this topic, this issue, and we uh, came to the conclusion that governance is the key aspect here. You have to involve decision makers and uh, several other stakeholders within the city. You have to have mechanisms to bring those different stakeholders together. We also focused on the concepts of locality and continuity. And after a while, our ideas uh, changed, actually. So the topic of our uh, report, uh, our project, was conservation of Istanbul uh, intangible cultural heritage sites. We focused on four historical districts, Fatih, Eyüp Sultan, Beyoğlu, and Üsküdar. And we have world heritage sites, Sultan Ahmed, Süleymaniye, Zeyrek, and Karasuları. We had to draw conclusions on three different scales. On one hand, how we see Istanbul, and on the other hand, how we see conservation in Istanbul. These were the scales that we had to come up with conclusions. Istanbul municipality was our partner. Bimtaş and Itu Nova joined the supporters later on. I'd like to thank all the sponsors and supporters. The process was divided into three stages. The first stage is strategic vision development. So for three months, we worked on what heritage is and what heritage sites we should focus on in Istanbul. And the, uh, the second stage was the field work stage. And we ran questionnaires and focus group meetings and interviews in the heritage sites. All in all, we had six workshops, questionnaires in four languages uh, among 2,235 people. Because in the localities that we worked on, English, German, Arabic, and Turkish were the main languages spoken. When you are on the street, when you, want to try, uh, when you try to understand uh, the visitors, you have to organize these questionnaires in four languages. We had 30 interviews with many different people, hotel owners, uh, clerics, muhtars. So we tried to be within the community as much as possible. And we had five focus group meetings. Our human resources were uh, the project team consisting of 12 people, 70 academics and experts. Uh, focus group meetings with 71 people and questionnaires among 2,235 uh, people. The outputs are as follows, 15 reports. six workshop booklets and two resolutions. These are some details, therefore I'll skip them. I'd like to stress the importance of these two books actually, the summary, uh, summary of what we've done in the project. And these are the workshop booklets and workshop reports for each district. My colleagues are going to continue with the project. All of us attach great importance to the fact that conservation is a social matter. Governance, participation, uh, these are elements which are intertwined. To protect, to conserve cultural heritage, a holistic and continuous approach should be adopted. And it should be through a participatory pro a process. We had uh, come to some conclusions about conservation as well. 
I mentioned earlier that we tried to draw conclusions on three di different scales. Our first scale was Istanbul, the second one was districts, and the third scale was uh, world heritage sites, heritage sites. I'll try to summarize our conclusions on these scales. For the scale of Istanbul, we tried to have a multi-layered and diversified approach. Multi-layered meaning layers like history and all historic uh, phases in Turkey, Roman times, Byzantine times, uh, Ottoman times, and the Republic times. And of course, we have other layers, cultural layers, like cuisine, uh, clothing, and our mission was to discover, to register, conserve, sustain, and share with the rest of the world the richness of Istanbul. Our vision was to convert districts of Fatih, Eyüp, Beyoğlu, and Üsküdar into a livable world heritage, heritage areas and to present them as an example of global and local unity of belonging. So these districts are also residential districts. They also contain many artifacts of heritage. How we can bring uh, those two aspects together was our main concern. And as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to present Istanbul as the unity of global and local belongings. This was for the scale of Istanbul. As for the district, we understood that each district was unique in itself. In our project, we focused on four districts, but Istanbul has 39 administrative districts. And we have to understand that all these four districts have different uh, features, and they're unique. Fatih, for instance, is the heart of Istanbul, and it's a world heritage, heritage site. This is also the understanding and perception of the people living in Istanbul. We understood that through the questionnaires. It is the heart of Istanbul, and it is a world heritage site. Therefore, we had to take this district into consideration with its many different elements. Uh, the other districts, Beyoğlu, Üsküdar, and Eyüp, are not like this. There are four UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Fatih, but of course, Fatih uh, is not limited with those. Fatih has much more. Therefore, we have to be very careful about conserving Fatih as it is, because we see it, we consider it as a World Heritage Site in all its, uh, within all its ter territories. Eyüp is known as the spiritual center of Istanbul. This is one element which should not be missed, actually. So when we define Eyüp, we have to stress the fact that it is a sp spiritual uh, center of Istanbul. And many people create a link between Eyüp and the Golden Horn. So the district of Beyoğlu is known for its cosmopolitan structure and being open to uh, innovations. We had this understanding in mind, but we were assured of our uh, presumptions by after seeing the results of the questionnaires. And again, Beyoğlu is known for its Taksim neighborhood, but again, it's not only limited with uh, Taksim. It has many more neighborhoods, which are very important, and we have to take them as a whole. The fourth district we focused on is Üsküdar, and Üsküdar is the 
other side of the coast, actually, other side of Bosphorus. It looks at Fatih and it looks at Bosphorus and it is also identified with Bosphorus. Our third scale is UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Our mission was to focus on each and every World Heritage Site to unearth their beauties in a holistic manner. So within this framework, here is our conclusion. We have to have a cultural heritage uh, understanding which is beyond conservation. We have to focus on livable cities, livable cultural heritage sites. And cultural heritage should be for the sustainable development of towns, cities, and for its resilience. Cultural heritage enables cities uh, to develop by benefiting or by feeding on its uh, past and building a bridge to the future. That's why cultural heritage is very important. Thank you very much. We are running out of time, uh, but thank you. Um, Look, looking forward to your questions. Eda Nüce Soy will be the next speaker. Çok teşekkürler. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Hello. In my presentation, I will talk about well, it's about the methodology of the research we uh, carry out. What kind of methodological uh, approaches can be developed when we investigate or research? heritage cities and uh, cultural heritage what, what are innovative what is an innovative approach and what kind of tools can we use to do that well you all know um, in 2023 a plan of istanbul cultural they talk about global competitiveness it should create high value added have an innovative economy and uh, creative should be creative and uh, should have a say in the global economy in, in a nutshell so this is uh, well 1980s it, there were shanties there were minibuses and itinerant um, vendors and well Murat Gensh uh, called it the informal industri industrial city a, a monstrous industrial city and we will change that image and we will create uh, an innovative uh, creative economy uh, in our city well it's a nice goal and um, it is shared by many other cities and when you look at the strategy document um, they it has three components one of those is pleasant, livable, unique uh, city, urban pl pl creating of urban spaces that are livable, pleasant and sustainable. Preserve or conserve um, cultural heritage with the historic urban, uh, urban landscaping. Um, preserve both the intangible and the intangible um, legacy is mentioned in this plan as well. So when you look at the World Heritage Sites, this is 1985, they were proclaimed uh, by UNESCO, so there are four sites. And um, these sites, they are in the historical peninsula in Fatih. They are important landmarks and unfortunately today they look like this. Um, we see urban poverty, uh, dilapidation, lack of conservation, actually, the opposite. Well, in various periods, uh, well, they, they were at risk of losing world uh, status of World Heritage Site, and some policies were recommended to avoid that. And here, in this study, when we initiated the study, we um, talked, started talking about or thinking about the methodology at first. 
So yes, a conservation infrastructure is required and when we have a look at the legal status of all of these areas, we have uh, conservation plans, uh, plans in place and the legal framework exists and it is quite sound but and um, it has been designed parallel to the developments in the world and these are very strong powerful legal frameworks that exist but we can't we're not able to conserve them adequately and we can't convert it and we can't do it in practice why why is that we thought uh, conservation methods, the nature essence of conservation and the anthology of conservation um, was discussed. I like this map from 1913-1914 showing Istanbul. Uh, the special link of cons relationships of, regarding conservation. Uh, buildings that are subject of conservation. They, they showed in what uh, spatial framework uh, they were placed we wanted to f f see that and this is istanbul uh, the historic peninsula fatih district beginning of 20th century uh, the covers all of the uh, then existing settlement Beol started to develop as well but that's uh, the entire settlement back then today we have this uh, in 1910 so uh, as we got a spatial framework or structure from 1910, uh, the area we would like to conserve, and we superimpose it on the current map, and we're trying to protect it within this framework, and there's a scale well, issue, as you can see. Spatial development of Istanbul. Here are other examples, uh, looking at the same subject. So. Since ancient times, we see that these um, areas, they have ha had several characteristics up until 1920s. This, this, there is a spatial scale, there is an interaction, spatial interaction, which is uh, protected, preserved to a certain extent. But as of 1950s, this system of interaction changes. And today we have different layers that were added to it and um, and and the spatial interactions there have to be evaluated in a different uh, way the, uh, what kind of method do we need to develop um, in our research so we discussed that and we uh, the street focus uh, came to mind so this would provide a new framework a new scope and it would guide our way we thought and then um, so we so as an observational unit, we picked the street and um, also as a unit of analysis, the street. So and it was quite rewarding because by selecting the street, I will show it soon, we had a look, we could also view um, the social life, in intangible cultural heritage. It's an intangible cultural heritage, social life and shared practices uh, we saw those two and we conducted surveys we collected socioeconomic data household data and um, in addition to those we well we could associate them with the street and we the street was approached in a multi-layered way in our analysis here you see a methodolog methodological analysis of the street these units here are the dark ones they are uh, they should be subject to con subjected to conservation, the dark ones. But uh, we had uh, a parcel approach. So um, the social characteristics have been homogenized for that parcel. Uh, when we focus on the street, uh, the characteristics of the to be protected um, structure can be considered together with the street or taken um, together with the street, we thought, and other than the characteristics of the building, I mean, the street, day-to-day -day life on the street, um, we look at the World Heritage Site characteristics, they talk about street uh, texture and uh, there are elements that belong to the street. Uh, we 
which are an asset as well and so so we focused on the street as well and uh, we have to build a bridge from the past to the present by looking at the street so we in our street research we look at the specialty of areas of spaces and we have made these we've collected these data these four uh, world heritage sites they're independent from one another actually they look sim they look alike and but it's not that's not the case and then here you see uh, their population uh, that is out of work that doesn't work it's a Suleimani, for example here and uh, the paid workers they are more and more paid uh, workers live there which balances it each out in Zeyrek we have uh, an extensive uh, household unit uh, and and the uh, the rates of ownership um, are co are higher than the average in the world and so here you, you see so the socioeconomic structures um, so after analyzing social economic aspect we um, consider doing additional research by way of utilizing other sources and the way the fact that we selected the street was advantageous so we analyzed additional sources um, and we real estate taxation and uh, is shown here and the conservation specialists and the academicians well they they know all of these and they have um, collect they have data but um, we have we had to adopt a holist holistic approach here and um, there, there are three negative uh, they're stagnant uh, and then positive value increases um, growth of value considering the street especially in Suleymaniye and Sultan Ahmed in certain areas uh, in those two districts uh, there is a very quick and rapid the progressing dilapidation and so we've diversified all of those uh, we see use uh, the, the same database we saw some fluctuations uh, in the streets and uh, which is more uh, quickly dilapidating which streets are collapsing on the verge of collapse and and was analyzed and we could trace it Then there are some well, well, we develop recommendations regarding world heritage sites based on service and street work. Uh, we identify things to be improved, uh, what needs to be removed, what what needs to be revived or integrated, or and what needs to be conserved going forward. So and what kind of additional measures need to be taken for uh, conservation. So we uh, this is. The list of recommendations and then um, you see the street the social life and so we, we talked we conduct interviews we had focus, focus group meetings uh, as a result of which a model was developed conservation in istanbul well um, to protect uh, urban areas in istanbul which are under various pressures in you you need finan fin uh, financial dim to consider financial aspects governance and I can't read excuse me they are very uh, awareness raising so them and which actors which stakeholders uh, can be involved and what tools uh, can be developed to to do all of this uh, so uh, this ends my presentation the, the next speaker will talk about more about the results thank you very much. Çok teşekkürler. Vaktimiz çok daraldı. Well, thank you. We're really running out of time, so let's proceed quickly with Halil İbrahim Düzenli. My job is both easy and difficult. 
because my colleagues already talked about how the project began. They talked about the mission and vision and the development of the project. That's why my job is easier. But it is also difficult because what I'm left with is to describe the concrete recommendations that we developed out of this project. And it is quite risky to try to come up with recommendations for such a multi-layered city. At the beginning, it is hard to understand such a city with all its cells, with all its streets. You have to understand and absorb the city so well that you can recommend something. But I think conservation begins with understanding the city. Our concrete recommendations, as mentioned by Professor Yunus, is, uh, are based on our interviews with people and, as mentioned by Ms. Eda, uh, at the street level as much as possible. By looking at all the graphs, one can tell how complicated things were. The picture you're looking at now is the roof of Suleimaniye Mosque Complex. And um, on the other side, you see the Bayolo district. And this picture is the front end of Fatih district, the historic peninsula. It has different colors in different times, actually. This is why I'm showing these pictures. This is the new mosque and the Egyptian market in Fatih. This picture shows Topkapı Palace, one of the world's largest heritage sites. And this is the district of Beyoğlu and Galata Tower. Another story, another life. This is Eyüp Sultan. Again, this is one of the historic districts. And in a very tiny and squeezed area, you see hundreds of little domes and little uh, roofs. This is part of Üsküdar, the part at the other side of Bosphorus looking at Fatih. So Üsküdar tells a totally different story to us. Let's have a look at the details of the World Heritage Sites. Again, these pictures will tell you how complicated and how complex the city is. Uh, Sultan Ahmed, the Blue Mosque. When you change the angle, you see a completely different landscape. You can see the street structure, street uh, tissues, and the Blue Mosque, Hagia Sophia, and Galata Tower all in one row. Topko Palace, again, in the same site. Suleimaniya Mosque and its surrounding. It's a conservation area. Again, it is one of the most important architectural complexes of the world. But when you look at the uh, vicinity of the mosque, the image is not that good. And uh, this picture shows Zeyrek Mosque and its vicinity. It, was, it used to be a church, uh, was later converted into a mosque. The mosque itself, again, uh, this picture shows the city walls, the land walls. This is one of the longest city walls in the world. Again, it has many problems. For instance, right inside the walls, you see 
a garage for public buses. The gates, the towers on the wall. So that was the street level. I'm going to show you some graphs now, some statistics. What you see on the screen is a 47-page document explaining seven strategies, 24 objectives, and 139 project chapters. Within the five minutes I have left, I'll try to explain all of these. But of course, off the top of my head, because if I go into detail, it will take us a very long time. You have the report. If you want to see the details, please uh, visit the report. Our first strategy was to look at the details of uh, these districts. So we have Fatih district, the land walls, Suleymaniye, Zeyrek, Eyüp, and Üsküdar. Our first strategy was to ensure a holistic conservation. A district does not only consist of streets. Istanbul does not only consist of four districts. It says it has 49, uh, 39 districts. So our first strategy focuses on tourism in cultural heritage sites. Under the chapter of tourism, we have sectoral diversity, employment and competition. To fulfill uh, this goal, you have to improve the infrastructure, innovative promotion, organization, and diversity in tourism. There are many certificates that you can apply to. But what should be interpreted from this graph is that these are the main tourism routes. And we have some existing tourism access. And this uh, tourism area can be st further strengthened by implementing eight different projects. The second strategy was on sectors, improving sectoral diversity, imp improving employment and competition. To achieve this goal, you have to increase the added value and economic uh, livelihoods and diversity. You have to focus on environmental friendly local production so there should be innovative sectors. What does it mean, locality? Let me focus on Eyüp Sultan to give an example. Eyüp is known for its music industry. We have a cafe for musicians, and there are still people visiting uh, that cafe, actual real musicians. Towards the end of the 20th century, uh, the music industry moved to Unkapını, and there is another music industry in Galata. In fact, we can see the same industry, the music industry, in three different uh, heritage sites that we observe. Some of them have been forgotten. Some of them had to abandon uh, their original uh, space. So we have to bring life back to those areas. We have to bring back music to Eyüp, to Galata, and to Unkapan in Fatih. That's another aim of the of, uh, project, actually, to focus on these sectors and to bring 
back life to them. There are also some commercial lines between uh, those districts, so you have to revitalize those commercial lines. Decentralization and refunctioning of the cultural heritage sites. That's a very challenging topic for us because, as you know, Suleimaniye and Fatih is also in the heart of different industries like paper production and other types of production. There are small scale workshops and plants which cause a great risk in the region actually in case of a fire or an earthquake. So these plants, these little workshops must be m moved from uh, this area. But as we decentralize uh, these plants or workshops, we have to find further employment to those people. So the idea is that now that we're going to declare these districts as districts of cultural heritage, we have to implant some uh, sectors uh, which would f trigger further employment in these districts. As you know, the municipality has a conservation directorate and we can co cooperate with them and create workshops for traditional artisanal activities like shoe works, leather works, timber conservation. We have another strategy with six objectives. This strategy is cultural heritage and daily life. So having cultural heritage and daily life hand in hand. We have far too many projects under this uh, strategy actually. The question is how we can make sure that people still find a living within the sites of cultural heritage. These sites should not be considered or should not only be seen only as museums. These should be livable areas. Istanbul has cultural and natural landscapes. What do we mean by that? We start with Eyüp and it includes the Golden Horn, the city walls, Yeni Kapı area. So this entire area has a unique landscape, but the landscape is fragmented. So we should ensure continuity, some transition in those different landscapes. What brings these different landscapes together is the city walls actually. So there are 10 different segments throughout the wall. We can use that space for exhibitions in Biennales. We can provide them to artists so they can uh, open workshops in those uh, walls. The walls have those spaces actually, which can be used as workshops. So that's the idea bringing together natural and cultural landscape to the service of people. And the Golden Horn, there are little islands. And these islands are abandoned. They're not used. They're marked on the map here. They're part of the natural landscape. In Istanbul, we have uh, six endemic trees. I forgot their, their names. One has purple flowers. They have different colors. They have different uh, smells. And we have the famous tulip. It's endemic to Istanbul as well. 
we only see tulips in the court, Ottoman court, but in the past, uh, tulips were grown all through the coast. So we can revitalize tulip production uh, in those territories as well. Under the strategy of heritage and uh, living spaces, we have to strike a balance between conservation and use. We have uh, public focus points. We will create new public spheres, public quarters. Another objective is to improve the quality of life. To do that, we have to uh, revitalize the public hotspots. All the markings here show different layers of the city and different uh, services like cultural services, sports services. We can uh, establish links between uh, those different services. Of course, transport and accessibility uh, are important issues as well. Education, culture, art, and sectoral relations is another strategy. Belonging and awareness. And the seventh strategy is what is stressed by Yunus. building governance and institutional capacity. So thank you very much. Uh. Thank you very much. So we had six speakers and there was a delay naturally. Uh, um, the, the subject is quite comprehensive and uh, I would like to read the questions from the application. The first question goes to Ellen. Local government invest sufficiently in the management of the historic environment. Yes. That's a great question because it allows me to say that the successful building trus preservation trusts work very closely with their local government mm -hmm. and they work hand in hand. Some of them are too close that the person that works for the local government is in the chair of the preservation trust. So, in, like most things in life, we need a balance. Mm -hmm. Some are remote, some are too close, but many have the right balance of information and action. Thank you, Alan. Uh, dear Soru. Next question. Dear Tracy is not known. I'll, I will read the question. Maybe it's for Yunus, Professor Yunus, or is there a problem with the system? I can't all, um, turn it on. Okay, I, I'll read. In the um, zoning amnesty law um, to the Turkish, for the Turkish professors, in Fatih district only Suleymaniye and Sultan Ahmed is covered. Uh, but, but it is within, w outside of the scope of the law, and which will hurt the cultural heritage of Suriçi and, and the entire district. So it, this um, district is not covered within the amnesty law. Who has the is bold enough to answer the question, Hi, Professor? Hani, cultural heritage. Yeah, we hurt cultural heritage in many ways that not only this year, not only with this law, not only no, now, I mean, uh, yes, we have, um, well, monumental structures, buildings, uh, good that we have them, but we have only two historic ancient streets in Fatih, where the heart of the city is in Fatih. Only th two of these streets are ancient, called ancient or historic. So we, I think this, this zoning amnesty law is wrongful when it comes to these ancient sites, but this is a, uh, has been going on for the last 100 years. It's, it's the same story again and again. Okay, I think you, uh, that's a good basis. Now, next question. Um, sustainable cultural heritage management. 
Um, on the islands, we have these horse uh, carriages, and there we talked about tangible and intangible cultural heritage. And um, while they're used for touristic purposes, the so horse culture, ho horse carriage, the, the last horse carriages are on the islands. And it has been debated for many uh, months, and it's a hot topic today in Turkey. Well, who will answer this question about the horses and car horse carriages on the islands? Well, we have to also say that the health of horses, I mean, the welfare of horses is also an important aspect. I think it was not a question, it was a comment. Yes, but we can uh, and respond to that comment. Uh, so, the metropolitan mayor, I mean, the mayor of the city, made a statement about that. Uh, it requires a balanced solution. So you have to think about the horses on one hand, because they... Uh, uh, run under very uh, difficult conditions. It's not acceptable, but then, then it's a cultural well heritage. So um, let's see what, what will happen in the future. Thank you for this comment. Uh, the project mentioned by the Shehir University, I mean, is addressed in the other question. Sulukule uh, transformation projects. Uh, lessons drawn from the Sulukule transformation project. What are the lessons? from that Sulkule. Tangible, intangible, who would like to answer? Yunus Eda. Microphone, please. Well, uh, we wanted to um, look at the street, so in our studies. In the past, we have had this, these negative perceptions regarding projects, and we wanted to change that by um, focusing on the street. And, well, uh, what can we do about it in a different way? I mean, Suluk, you know what happened with the Sulukule project, and we have a court decision on that. And the, the entire project was cancelled by the court. Uh, stay of execution verdict, yes. Uh, uh, well, 12 years later, yes, came the stay of execution. But um, in our project, and you, Professor Yunus mentioned it, uh, so to cover, to include the Syrians, we uh, conducted Arabic uh, uh, interviews in Arabic. We visited the Arabian families as well. It was not a group-specific or a building-specific approach. So we wanted to cover the entire space and by including the entire households, everyone and whoever lives there, uh, how to include them and then develop a heritage perception uh, uh, around that and to develop a conservation project, including everything in a holistic way. Uh, I think the methodology is quite positive. Um, in regarding Sulukule project, uh, Robert um, talked about it uh, on ro about Roman, uh, the Roman, Roman culture. Well, it's an established culture and it should be preserved and uh, then negative lessons regarding it, the way it is applied and so Um, Yunus Bey, you can, well, talk to, well, <laughs> the current state of the project is well known, so it was not worthwhile. Well, the, the governance uh, aspect is, is crit was critical and the participation of people was an important critical aspect. So it was a kind of a case study. There are other cases, uh, one of these more negative case studies. Maybe I should ask Yunus, because it is related to his presentation. Um, well, uh, in ancient sites, well, being in revitalized and instead of increasing revenues, uh, and well, we there, yes, people invest and they want, want to make money, and but on the other hand, a balance has to be well, well, that's important, Preserve conservation, and then we have um, the city uh, and the link between those 
um, so profit increase, revenue increase. So we have that uh, aspect, uh, and then we have a viable stand. Uh, we have things to be conserved, and all these. Th this interaction is important with living labs. Well, we ha there are cr environments which discuss all of these together and. Uh, what is the best for the city? This is the uh, critical question. And this is how it should be seen. And uh, otherwise, I mean, other interests uh, will gain dominance and uh, misguide the entire project. And one more question. El in Ellen's presentation, they talked about two things. Uh, one is, uh, well, uh, inventory. So it's, it was deficient, and they um, they collected data, and then a profit increase, revenue increase out of this. Yeah, I think there, he, th there are two issues that were mentioned there as well. Well, in the real estate panel uh, uh, yesterday, we heard about this profit increase approach and how it can be managed in a more rational manner and uh, we need to refine our perspective there and it's very complex and re random and how can we re-functionalize uh, these these um, sites well I have a question for Nezapi um, Eda talked about the street focus in her presentation and they and her approach and your approach Jane Jacobson, you mentioned uh, the, the urban vi vision of Jane Jacobson. So comparing all of those, what kind of lessons can we draw from the street when, when designing and planning a city? What is your point of view? One of the um, lessons that has come through <coughs> from the way that de uh, designers approached um, urban areas <coughs> from um, from the 1950s and 1960s was um, very much uh, plan level. <coughs> um, and a plan and a map is uh, God's eye view. This is what you would see in a plane. Uh, this is what you would see if you were God looking down. Uh, and, and very often, <coughs> uh, because they weren't considering the viewpoint of the person on the ground, in the street, the results were less than hoped for. Mm. Um, and so um, the city at eye level you know, is, is really, really important. Um, this is the scale at which we, um, our senses are working. <clears throat> what we can see, what we experience, the textures, um, uh, the sounds, everything um, comes back down to us as humans. Um, we experience through our senses. Um, we interact and design and designers really need to get back to those basics um, those are the things that really worked in the old cities in the best parts that we you know go on holiday uh, the tourists come here to experience the city at that level um, and so that's something that designers are beginning to appreciate um, and, and, and, and, and, and look back to some of that knowledge that was lost in, in, mm -hmm. in, the, um, in the modern movement. Um, so, um, I mean, <clears throat> obviously there's a lot more. I mean, there are various tools, um, the morphological tool that um, Ida was referring to, you know, where you're looking at different layers. Um, that also came out in uh, the presentation by Halil and the recommendations, uh, really looking at it in a very structured way, but, be, you know, but beginning at the level of, you know, uh, the user. Thank you, Nezapi. Uh, and I have a question for Lakshmi. It, um, well, with there, we run a project uh, uh, supported by the British Council, uh, the two universities that are here. And Lakshmi is one of uh, the managers of this project implement as well. Uh, she talked about the smart cities and heritage management, when we consider all these two together. Um, what future potential needs to be further investigated, uh, do you think? Um, thinking about the smart city approach and heritage management, 
any um, potential innovative new areas of research that you have come across that you want to mention here? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, one of the research papers I recently came across uh, was um, putting culture almost in the heart of smart city planning. So the framework developed by the researcher, I, I think I did put it in my slide. Uh, uh, so the, what the researcher does is a smart city is uh, has is an inter like you no know, it, it it needs to have an interface of culture, metabolism, and governance. Uh, so what the res what the research project itself says was how culture has to be a part of smart cities, and metabolism is smart metabolism, um, smart consumption of resources, and uh, governance has to be smart. Um, so this is one of the framework which has been recently come up where culture is almost part of smart city framework. But apart from that, uh, one main step which needs to be uh, taken is to bring technologists, urban designers, social scientists, everybody together to understand how people would actually be uh, uh, experiencing whatever technology is being given. And uh, there are several technologies which are developed which are not accessible for people for several reasons. Uh, for example, one classic example is uh, the 100 Smart Cities mission, which was developed in India. So uh, India had this great vision of developing 100 cities uh, to become smarter. Most of the cities, mo almost the mission failed, mainly because they did not understand how people are actually going to access this technology. So everything was happening at a very infrastructure level. Uh, so we need to we need to go back to how users are going to experience, users are going to access, how are we going to empower people to actually have these citizen science skills. Uh, so these are some of the you know, discussions which need to happen between the stakeholders from different disciplines as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think... Um, the closing panel will begin. Uh, last question. Do you have a question? Microphone, please. Microphone, please. <laughs> We, we can't hear the participant. She's not using any microphones. Tekrar alabilir miyiz? Elna's sorunuzu tekrar alalım. Sesinizi almakta zorlanıyoruz. Ha, mikrofonla alsak sesinizi alamadık. Buraya da tam. Soruları hızlıca tekrar bir daha söylemenizi istiyoruz. Rica. Can you repeat your questions? Microphone is off. The microphone is not on. Can you turn it on? Microphone is not on. Sorry. Okay. Historic buildings. Um, it's a personal experience. Uh, for uh, some of the historic buildings, insurance companies do not want to insure them because they are high risk. They, uh, and I don't think that the experience I had is, is just a, a rare one. It's a sort of quite in, in Istanbul. And I was uh, wondering whether you have come across any examples like this in the UK. And if there are, there is any system that actually ensures the historic buildings are insured properly? Okay, thank you for the... Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, I have a relatively simple answer in that I'm very familiar with two insurance companies in the UK who, in fact three companies, who specialise in the insurance for uh, charitable organisations who have the building at their heart. So I could give you specific examples. There's the Ecclesi Ecclesiastical Insurance Company. Sorry, you can't hear me, can you? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
there are two. There are two companies in the UK that specialise in the insurance for charitable organisations who have their historic asset at their heart. And I'll give you those two examples. One is the ecclesiastical insurance company that do not just focus upon ecclesiastical buildings. They can go beyond that remit. And the second one is a commercial outfit called Aon. And again, they've worked very closely with trusts throughout the UK. And they've been extreme. I mean, I, I have personal experience where a building at risk was at such risk that it could have been subject to arson overnight. And at various points in the planning process, people wouldn't sleep because they think this building is seriously at risk. And yet the, insurance, the insurer knew what those risks were and supported that project throughout. So I can think of two positive examples. Um, and I think that's the best place to leave it, that I, that I have success stories. I'm sorry, but I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat the question? Uh, we, I have to uh, adjourn the session. Uh, you can ask uh, the next question to the Shehir University official if you wish later on. Thank you, Alan. Thank you.